Yeah. Okay, we're live. So uh, welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Today we're talking uh, control, control of action. And we're going to talk about this kind of very important concept within the ecological approach, dynamical systems approach, uh, prospective control, kind of an alternative to the traditional way we think about controlling our movements and controlling our actions, which is more predictive kind of control. So we're going to get into this uh, topic in, in depth. And as, as with all these, um, if if anyone has any questions along the way, and but please uh, put, put them in the YouTube or wherever you're watching, and I can bring them up on the screen. Um, I'm not. I'll do a quick introduction because all three of these guys have been on this before, one of these before. So we have today. We have Tyler Yearby and, and Garrett Boyum from Emergence. I'm joining us again, and we have Andrew Wilson from Leeds Beckett. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. So. What I thought I would do, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> what I thought, so uh, by the way, to kind of uh, preparation for this, we 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 looked at the article, uh, a review article that Gilles Montan wrote quite a few years ago now, uh, perspective <clears throat> control in sport. Um, the kind of basic covers it. There's it's a it's a little bit out of date now. Actually, there's been some a lot of research, but I think it covers the basic concepts. But Prospective control, I think, is something you could probably explain in 10 different ways. <laughs> so what I thought we'd do is we'd go around and everyone just could say what a, a few words about what you, you know, in the, you know, a few words about what you, perspective control is to you, how you would explain it, maybe an elevator pitch, whatever you want to think of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to go into super depth, just kind of the basic concepts that I think we could probably, I bet you we could all say add a little bit to the explanation as we go around. So maybe, do you want to start with Tyler? Do you want to take a crack sure. at it? Sure. Let's yeah. do it. I, I love yeah. this because I know they were going to be doing this, which makes it even better. <laughs> uh, I think for me, the easiest way to describe it is to give an example. Um, so, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm an individual or an athlete that's moving to intercept a ball and, you know, you pick the sport, football, baseball, basketball, that's uh, rather than it being something that, like you mentioned, being predictive where I know the landing point of that particular ball, I'm rather going to be using information that as I continue to move, I generate information and that information specifies what my action capabilities are. And so essentially I need to intercept that ball. So I might need to accelerate to essentially cancel out the vertical um, type movements. I need to decelerate. I need to turn. And the information is essentially going to specify what I need to do online in real time. And the importance of that is because the way in which I interact with the environment is going to allow me to uh, have the information I need as a performer to make sure that I intercept that ball at the correct moment in time, or whether I choose to pull off and and take it off the wall. If we're talking about baseball, for example, so for for me, it is very much um, regulating my behavior, and it is uh, an information based type control. And there's a circular link between that movement and that information, uh, such that it shouldn't be separated and can't be studied in that way as well. Okay, great, Andrew. Do you want to? Anything to add to that or a different way? Yeah. Of so um, perspective control is probably one of my favorite just sort of things in the ecological approach, uh, not only because there's a ton of evidence in favor of it, but also it's just a really interesting um, topic because it's a it's it's one of those rare ecological topics that's being pitched explicitly against a more representational uh, approach, right? So prospective control versus predictive control. Um, and these things are sometimes actually put head to head, which is always fun and is not as not that common in the research literature. Um, so for me, um, it's, a, it's, an eco, it's an ecological attempt to try and address a really real problem. And the real, very real problem is that um, we clearly seem to organize our behavior sometimes with respect to something that hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> and that might be in the near future, et cetera. And the classic obviously is the outfielder. You have to be at the right place at the right time in order to catch the ball. But that point in space and time is in the future because it just is, right? Because the ball's busy doing something else right now. Um, and that's weird when you think about it. That's a big ask of a system. Um, but the, the predictive versus the perspective um, uh, sort of definitions really lay out the two different ways of thinking about what's going on. The predictive model, the predictive account says that because we have something, some kind of representational system in between us and the world, then that system has to be has to be predicting, has to know where to take us. The ecological claim is that there's nothing in between us and the world. Right? There is us. There is the world, and we are we are 
entangled with it, right? And so the question is, if we're entangled with the world, how do we get, how do we interact with a world that hasn't happened yet? And it, so it's a huge question, right? And if we didn't have an answer for it, then we'd be in big trouble. But luckily it turns out that when you, when you, allow, when you ask the question, when you're forced to ask the question and start thinking, okay, what sort of information is around and that you could connect yourself to in the here and now, such that if you if you do that, then you'll end up achieving something in the future, and that's a it's a it's a it's a weird way of thinking about what's going on, but it's the essence of the ecological approach. So it's cool, and it's yeah, and and that's what it's about. It's about trying to find a way to uh, identify how what we're currently doing will allow us to be somewhere else in the future, right? And it turns out when you go poking around. There are, there are options. The reason you can catch a fly ball is that there are ways of doing this, and it's cool. Mm -hmm. Garrett, do you have it? So I guess for me, I'm going to kind of kind of talk about it in the way that Andrew did a little bit of, in terms of what mm -hmm. interests me the most about it, because I think Tyler and Andrew both gave really good answers to it. But I think this is really interesting when we think about it in terms of hitting in baseball, um, which is something that I'm super interested about. and I know. There are people currently doing some research on it um, with gaze behavior. And I think it's it's a really interesting alternative to this notion of like, are we trying to predict where the ball is going to be? Or are we gathering information, moving, and trying to use that information as it's developing to get us into position to actually be able to hit the ball? And so I think that's that was one of the cool things to read about in the paper was that this stuff actually applies to very fast actions that would be something like hitting a baseball. And I think that because of some of the research of like how we can't track the ball the entire way, you know, makes people think that, well, there must be a predictive element to it. And um, that's kind of what I hope to kind of explore a little bit today here as well. Yeah, no, those are all great. I think they'll, they'll connect well together. And um, a couple of us, uh, we use, you know, the classic example prototypical is the fly, catching a fly ball on baseball. Been, we'll talk a lot about that, but I'm going to make us push beyond the, the prototypical example. In particular, we'll talk what happens when things get really fast, right? That's one of the critiques. But yeah, the way I would put it too, yeah, I think you're all hit the nail on the head. You're trying to organize your behavior right to the future, you're trying to achieve something in the future. That's what perspective means, right? You know, in the future. And you could do it one of two ways. You could, you have somehow, so you somehow have to organize your behavior in terms of where the ball is going to land and when it's going to be there. And the obvious assumption is you need to know those things. And to me, perspective information is like a miracle of nature. Like, how could you possibly achieve something in the future without knowing the future? <laughs> it's I, like, I mean to that. God. it's like ridiculous. Like, um, how could I, I, so it seems un impossible that you'd have to do that. So in predictive control, I try to know where the ball is going to be, where it's going to land, and when it's going to get there and generate a movement. In perspective control, there's this uh, information I can pick up that can tell me, but basically the first term I like, it tells me about my current future. So it tells me if I currently keep doing what I'm going to do, what's going to happen in the future? And that future, am I going to arrive where the ball is at the right time? And it's and, and so if you keep this arrangement going, you, you're you going to achieve your action without actually ever knowing what having to predict these things, which I think is, is incredible. And and so that's one of the things that attracted me to. And I, we talked about it a little bit. Is there any other things people want to pull out about what kind of really appeals to how it appeals to you? Um, you find one of the reasons I like. Uh, maybe I can start. One of the things I like about it is it solves the, the the problem of perception and action at the same time, right? The predictive model, even if I could make a perfect prediction about where the ball is going to land and when it's going to land there, what do I do next, right? How fast do I run? Do I do an all-out sprint to get there? Mm -hmm. Do I adjust my speed somehow based on time to contact? It, uh, all the predictive does is tell you what you need to know. It does, Perspective information tells you what you need to do, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, it solves perception and action at the same time. You don't mm -hmm. have to. You figure if I if the Chapman model, if the ball's accelerating too fast, I speed up. If it's not accelerating at all, I I keep doing what I'm doing. 
So it gives you, it solves what you need to do for action on, on the surface level. Obviously there's more to it than that. And to, to piggyback uh, on that, Rob, that part's really intriguing to me because when we talk about the Chapman fly ball example, uh, Michaels has given presentations and, you know, used that example before and discussed it in depth. Um, I think that's beautiful. And the other part that I like to look at, American football is my number one sport. And this could be said for any tackling based sports, but we're talking about the primary task of intercepting the ball at an at a end point that way that there's an out or that way I have, you know, received that ball so I can do something else with it. And so being the fact that I work with American football and we, we talk about move, moving bodies and where we are in space. So if we talk about intercepting that ball, and let's say it's on an outside breaking route in American football to where there's there's fixed boundaries that, have, that are there. We talked about in the, the journal club with you last time, or I mentioned there being constraints that are in place that are fixed, such as the boundary and the markings on a field. And so before a ball is snapped, I know I'm running an out route. I'm going to be adjusting my movements based off of what the defender is doing. Um, there's that relationship, that dyadic relationship that's there. But then after I've received that ball, there's their secondary tasks, such as not getting absolutely crushed or being able to explore, exploit that space. Mm -hmm. And so when we have that time to contact, such as the ball that's coming, that rate of expansion, and then we also have the space that is there that's obviously changing, you know, very rapidly. We have the directions of the defenders that are converging upon me. And I'm now trying to do something with that. Uh, that's the part that's really intriguing for me because when we talk about information-based control and allowing for us to regulate our action online, um, to me, there, there's not anything, there couldn't be anything such as a predictive mechanism that allows me to be in one spot because I'm constantly changing my behavior based off of the surroundings around me. And those surroundings are obviously the individuals that are there. It's the wind that's present. It's changing that time to contact. You know, my ability to perceive spin. And then Garrett, you mentioned how maybe the, the other systems, I kind of like to think about it. I, I look I like the uh, resonant systems uh, paper and I don't know how to pronounce his name actually, but uh, takes and colleagues, I believe is what it is. Um, he talks about how perce perception is essentially um, you know, the whole body of the athlete. And so I think it's a systems-based approach. I don't think it's exclusive to just the visual system, even though that's a strong system, strong perceptual system, but yet the auditory information that's there, the haptic information that I get based off essentially where, you know, defenders are around me is, is really, really unique. And that's the part that keeps driving me towards uh, really and truly a, a representative learning approach or a representative task design and really the need behind the why of having that in sport is that if we essentially try to create these actions in vacuums, um, it's not going to not going to unfold very well in a dynamic sporting environment where there is a lot of complexity. And I, I don't want to get too far into this because I, I would love to talk about information scaling, complexity and how that lives with this as well. Yeah. Can Andy? I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's two things. So, Rob, I think so it, um, I'm reading. I'm currently in a reading group and blogging about Turvey's lectures on perception book. And it's classic Turvey, right? It's really hard work, but it's so rewarding. And it was just funny. Your, your comment that perspective control intrinsically connects perception to action because it's information about what to do next is like this is again this is one of my perspective control is just one of my favorite examples of anything ecological because it just that's that's the essence of the ecological approach right there that these things are not separate and that these three things are so entangled and so intertwined and that's a hard thing for people to get their heads around because we spend so much time talking about them as different things and we don't even have a word for the whole system. We just call it the perception hyphen action mm -hmm. system, right? And so like one of you know, one of Turvey's big things is this is 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 this interconnectedness. And you're absolutely right. I think perspective control is super cool about that. I wanted to throw one thing in the title I was just talking about. And of course, one of the things about it, um, I kind of want to throw this out just to see what people think, and because I've been thinking about it recently and I don't know the answer. You talked about this as uh, uh, information-based control, right? So there's an example of where, uh, and, and it's always described this way, right? People are organizing their behavior with respect to the some some information variable you're trying to move so as to cancel out optical acceleration or whatever, right? So <clears throat> a few years ago, I read um, uh, Brett Fagin's stuff on affordance-based control. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. I like it a lot, and I haven't yet quite fully got it into my thinking. But... The, one of the essences of his challenge is, in fact, that affordance-based control is the correct ecological analysis rather than information-based control. And that distinction, I'm still, kind, I'm still kind of struggling with it. In the context of perspective control and any of these kinds of things, 
affordances are immediately connected because affordances are about opportunities for action. They're not, it's affordance perception is not event perception. Event perception is about what's happening now. Affordance perception is about what might happen in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And so Brett's big challenge, which I think is an excellent challenge and an as yet unmet challenge, is how to reconceptualize these information-based control strategies that we have all this evidence for think of them as affordance-based strategies because I think that's going to be the thing that really kicks it up a notch. Like, we're good. It's going well. Let's really commit to this and see what happens. I just, I, I, I don't know the answer. It just occurred to me to yeah. throw that in when you were talking about information-based control. Yeah. I don't want to know if anyone's been thinking about this. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Andrew. <clears throat> to, to put it back to the fly ball example, I'll give a tried example of what you're trying to... So imagine there's a fly ball hit in front of me. Uh, the optical information is telling me I need to run faster. Like the, the, so the, I'm coupling my running to the information. I keep running, running faster, faster, faster. Yeah, I'm never going to catch it. It's hit too short. If I just base my movement on information, I would keep running, running faster, faster, and I'd get to the ball, and it would skip by me, and it would turn the single into a triple. Nice. At some point, I need to recognize I don't have the capacity to regulate my behavior this way on the that, that's to all close the this information court by me yeah yeah and that's an afford i need to perceive the affordance of catchability at some point i need to recognize i cannot satisfy this control law i'm using is not going to work based on my capacity yeah so i'm i'm glad that uh, that opened up mm -hmm. the invitation there because when mm -hmm. i was giving the example earlier and talked about uh, you know essentially stopping and taking the fly ball off the wall that's that's kind of what i was uh you know trying to delineate there with the uh phagian example and the affordance based control why it, we actually have that in our course underpinnings and one of the reasons why that part is so intriguing to me and something i'm you know honestly working through a lot myself is if information specifies the affordances it's specifying the affor affordances based off of my action capabilities and like Turvey has talked to you brought up Turvey essentially as an organism I need to have effectivities that essentially can match the affordances you know or the information that is available and the affordances are specified uh, by the information based on my action capabilities so if I don't have the ability to get to that point uh, due to my you know my speed and whatnot uh, even if I'm trying to cancel it out but yet I don't have that effectivity as an animal um, I'm not able to intercept that fly ball. And so for, for me, that's where we get start talking about Gibson and essentially rejecting and, and accepting um, affordances based on our action capabilities. That example that Rob, you just now gave uh, would essentially be me rejecting the opportunity of trying to continue to keep moving because I don't have the capability to get there. But information is what guiding what is what is guiding that movements and whether it's high order invariance, what, you know, it, it's, it's essentially regulating my behavior, but there still has to be some type of. And that's where I start thinking about emergent decision making. You know, there's some type of mm -hmm. emergent decision making that occurs because th there has to be some decision that is made for me to either try to catch it still or not catch it or how I contort my body in a certain way in order to make sure I still can receive that ball. Uh, kind of bringing it back to the paper a little bit, and I can't remember exactly what page it's on, but it's talking about essentially the opening rate and angles of the gymnastics um, athletes as they're essentially trying to land. And there's amount of a fair amount of high variability there based off of the the information is, that is available or essentially what their uh, opportunities for action or invitations for action are there. And I kind of think about that in the same way, trying to think it back to my sport in football. If there is a, an, an outside breaking route and the ball is put in a decent spot at the cornerback or the safety is essentially converging at, at a you know very high rate of speed and there's a there's, there's a strong likelihood essentially of, of you know getting hit or taking some type of contact i uh i may essentially not move my arms out to intercept that ball until later in the movement because i'm trying to make myself as small as possible and there's no way that that's consciously going through in my opinion um, a receiver's head. I think it actually happens subconsciously or it happens based off of perspective control. And so essentially at the last minute, I reach up, take that ball. And to me, that is a deceptive action because one thing that I don't, I didn't see anywhere mentioned in that paper. I've also read uh, a lot of Fajan and Turvey's um, information affordances and control of action in sport, which I love that paper. Uh, it's mentioned in Dynamics of Skill Acquisition. Um, or, or excuse me, there's, it's perspective control is, but it's not talking about deceptive actions. So as, as a defender, if I'm trying to intercept a, a receiver that is carrying the ball, he is trying to essentially um, disrupt the stability of that system or essentially try to escape or get around me without me making the tackle. 
And so I'm still using that perspective type control to allow for me to be at that end point whenever he is getting there. But it's not the same as a fly ball now that is traveling at a you know, particular rate of speed that is essentially all of a sudden going hit to the, hit the brakes and take a sharp right. Whereas in American football, that in fact can happen. So that's where um, that, that future state of affairs or the future, you know, what, it, what can happen, the tendencies or the emergent tendencies, the, the intrinsic dynamics of that particular ball carrier and the orientation of how they're moving, the speed in which they're moving specifies a lot about what my opportunities are. So I'm trying to work through where the deceptive actions also live in perspective control. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Garrett, did you want to? Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting that Andrew, that you brought up and was, I was reading in, um, I think was reading in an article, um, in addition to this, when I was looking more into embodied cognition, which I think is another thing that could probably, um, speak to this as well about like things being entangled, um, is this, they mentioned in a paper, similarly, like perception is the perception of affordances. So like to go back to what Rob was saying about perspective control, you know, telling, helping you figure out what you should do, you know, it gives you the information of what you should do. Affordances basically tell you what you should do. So that perception of the affordance will tell you or direct your movement. And, and I like Andrew that you delineated the difference between information and affordances because you could be able to perceive information, but not know what to do with it. But if you're able to perceive an affordance, it actually directs you to like what you should do or helps guide your intention of to help achieving that goal. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I'd agree with that. I just, the reason I keep banging on about the distinction between information and affordances is it's the first thing Jeff Bingham taught me when I was in his lab. And it's the most important thing. And it's, being forgotten. <laughs> and this, is why, this is why I really like Brett's affordance-based control challenge to information-based control. The thing to remember is that, yeah, affordances are of the world, right? They're properties of the world, unless you're someone else and you're wrong. <laughs> so, okay. Mm. But they're, the world. they're about the world. And, and the thing about the world is that the vast majority of it is, to some degree or another, over there. We're not in mechanical contact with it, right? It's not pushing on me to make me do my things. So it's about cause and effect. How, do they, how, how does that thing over there cause me to do one thing rather than another thing? The link is information, right? So we are informationally connected to these things, but you've got to keep these things distinct in the analysis. So I agree, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really important to, to do that because you're perceiving the affordance. You're not perceiving the information, but you're perceiving the affordance by virtue of resonating to detecting you know, whatever the appropriate word is, you're, you're perceiving the affordance by virtue of the information and the information has consequences as well. So we just, it's, it's an important thing to keep. In. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, those are great. Um, oh, Garrett, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say, I think that it's important to make a distinction between information that is non-specifying versus specifying, like, because the specifying information is the thing that would, <laughs> would reveal the affordance. And I think, too, within this of like, if we're talking about embodied cognition, the intention of the performer will lead to what what the um, information affords. And so whether we're talking about a surface or whatever, like based upon the intention of the, the actor, that will guide what affordance they'll be able to find and pick up. Yeah. No, that can that's great. To the direct learning stuff, actually. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to the set your point about deception, Tyler. I just want to make a couple more points about kind of what perspective control is. So I would argue it's a way more parsimonious explanation of control, right? Because it's solving the perception, as I said, at the same time. Um, well, a good point Jill makes in uh, the articles, it's not just a matter of time scale, right? So if you keep updating your prediction during the movement, that's not perspective control. Right, you're still making, a if you update your prediction of where the ball's gonna land halfway there, you're still using predictive, you're doing it in a totally different way. <laughs> so you can do online predictive control, <laughs> if that sounds weird, they're different things. So I think that's an important point. Um, another example I would make is the, um, another good example of, is we've already talked about the fly ball is the bearing angle strategy, right? So in, in football, if you wanna tackle someone running on a field, you would think you would have to predict where they're going to be in the future, which is extremely hard in football, right? They're running, juking, but all you have to do is keep your angle the same between you and them and you will arrive. So it's, again, it's 
if you satisfy this control law, you'll get the future you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the essence of perspective control. And I also tease, I got Brett, Brett scheduled for an interview on the podcast Ooh. in a few weeks. So <laughs> if you have any questions, but Tyler, yeah, I wanted the deception is an interesting one because you know, Gibson talks about acting to perceive, but we're talking about our own perception. Yeah. Deception is acting to affect someone, alter someone else's perception, right? It's acting mm -hmm. to give the false intention of, of what you are planning. Yeah. So I think that's yeah, really yeah. interesting. So, an example yeah. would be, I work with a lot of receivers in football. An example mm -hmm. would be that there, as a defensive back, I mean, there's a lot of tasks, but essentially you're trying to blanket me to where I can't get open or I'm not able to catch the ball. I mean, that's, the, that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what the main task is. And there's obviously a number of ways in which to do that. And if I'm running a route as a defender and I don't have someone that's pressing me at the line, so there's essentially some space that is available, um, I'm not wanting to, number one, if we go back to like Bernstein's approach, I'm not wanting to accomplish the same task in the same way all the time because I'm not going to be very adaptable. I'm not going to be dexterous. So essentially, there's a level of repetition without repetition, meaning I'm going to run that route in a variety of different ways. Um, in addition to that being deceptive, that's one example. I may use my eyes to peek to a space on the field. And even though I'm peeking to that space, it's essentially trying to create space to, to separate or, or disturb the system stability between that 1v1 dyadic relationship. Because if I'm running an outside breaking route, and I'm going to be needing to have space available at that route. You know, I'm, I'm at the line of the scrimmage. I'm not being pressed. And so I'm running a route in a different way. I may peek to a space and in, into a particular part of the field. That way they're perceiving you know, what I'm, what I'm doing to create space for me to be able to get open. So that's an example of what I mean by being deceptive with that. And that's off the ball. You know, the ball is not even in flight yet. And so for, for that defender, if he's trying to blanket me, if that's his, if that's his task and he's using information and a bearing angle to guide his ability to do that, if I can, you know, deceive him, that's going to allow me to be successful in that action. And so that's kind of the example that I'm giving and, and the reason behind that. And, um, that, that part just is, is very real and meaningful in sport. And so whether that is truly in line with what we're discussing, I know that that is exactly what's being, how these principles are being applied. And maybe the, maybe it's the education of intention coupled with the attention, um, such as the direct learning example. But point being is we're, you know, myself specifically trying to take these ideas that, that are these theoretical principles and bring them into real life. What I mean bring them into real life, like bring them into sport and make it meaningful to the athlete without me having to do what we're doing right now and discuss all of this. But yet this is for me per personally, this is a need for um, utilizing, um, you know, approaches such as the constraint sled approach and allow allowing for the manipulation of constraints and the task constraints, the environmental constraints, maybe some explicit guidance from me as the coach to allow for those emergent tendencies and helping facilitate the process of self-organization in order for them to use that information prospectively to um, afford them or invite them to do certain actions on the field. Yeah, I think those are good points. Um, Can I jump yeah. in? Sorry, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so the thing about deception is actually kind of intriguing. So one of the reasons why it's really hard to fake someone out is that the perceptual information you use to perceive what someone is doing is just a, it's a lawful consequence of their dynamic full characteristics, right? And there's only so much you can do. Like, so, for example, if you're going to cut left, there's only so much cutting right you can fake before you are cutting right and you are no longer cutting left, right? Just for the sheer physics of trying to move your body in various directions. And when it turns out, people are very sensitive to these kinds of things. And that's why it's tricky. Turns out it's not impossible, though. So uh, mimes exist, right? Mm -hmm. Mimes exist, but miming is hard, right? Miming is mining really well, like really actually genuinely making it look like you can't get out of that glass cage. It's really <laughs> hard. Right? Why? Because you have to simulate all the dynamics that would normally be producing all the responses. And I just want to flag up that there's a, a, a great paper. So uh, Sverka Runson, Sverka and Runson, uh, 86, I think it is, is the first kind of, it's called the kinematic specification of dynamics. And it's basically where they introduce this idea that I, I rest on a lot. And they do a lot of things with, uh, you know, like point light displays, right? So the cool thing about point light displays is you can show all the motion, you can present all the information about how something is moving. Um, and then you can ask people to make judgments about the underlying dynamics. So you can get people to judge the gender of a walker, right? Because men and women walk differently. Why? Because of the, you know, the distribution of mass and all those kinds of things is different. And that has consequences for the way we walk. 
et cetera, et cetera. They did a great study. There's, there's an element of that paper, though. They actually studied deception. So what they did was that they recorded point light displays of people lifting a heavy weight versus pretending to lift a heavy weight. And then they got people to make judgments about those displays. And the first thing that came out of it um, was that everybody was, it was mind meltingly obvious to everybody which ones were the real ones and which ones were the fakes. Mm -hmm. And so there were two things going on for the fake conditions. People could clearly visually perceive by the way these people were moving two things. They could perceive that they were trying to pretend to look like they were lifting a heavy weight. And simultaneously, they could perceive that they were faking, right? Mm -hmm. and all of that was just in the way that, because the they weren't basically moving in a way that you move when you have a heavy weight, right? So, and yet, mimes are possible, okay? So it gets back to this deception thing, like what? how do you deceive and how do you tell the difference? A, you know, good deception requires you to actually do something um, remarkably similar to what it is you're trying to make it look like you're doing without falling so far into it that you can't do anything else. Like I say, like if you're trying cutting left versus cutting right, there's just flat out a point where you physically can't reorient your body. You're heading that way and you've got no freaking choice, right? So, <clears throat> but just to, just to kind of identify that there is a literature on thinking about these things from an ecological point of view, runs and stuff is top grade mm -hmm. and it's complicated. Mining is hard because these things are tied. And so actually one thing would be super cool. Who, who's good in football? Who's a, who's a good deceiver in football? Who's, who's really good at faking? Well, there's a lot. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people. And that's what's interesting about this while I'm trying to give you a perfect example, because I love the examples that you're giving as far as the tasks. Uh, the tasks are quite different, though. Uh, there's a different level of consequences that are present. And so for and then it also kind of speaks to, I guess, the need for effectivities, obviously, and the reason behind the, the abilities of individuals. Um, so there, there are a lot of different receivers that have those capabilities. I mean, during my younger days and growing up, uh, Michael Irvin for the Dallas Cowboys was was someone that was pretty deceptive, but yet he was also very physical as a receiver. So there's different mm -hmm. capabilities that are present. Um, you know, as far as individuals that play, I work with a couple. I'm not going to say say names, but they have they've had to utilize these opportunities of theirs because of limitations or rate limiters in other areas. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that we've had to work on often, simply because it's allowed them to create space so they can actually do something with it. And so, um, you know, I, I like the research. I have actually read that paper. The part that was so intriguing to me, and this is something a colleague of ours, Michael Zweifel, talks about who actually was a receiver, is essentially maintaining, you know, this a similar type posture mm -hmm. through certain parts of your, mm -hmm. your vertical displacement. And, and, the, and when I say vertical, like a vertical type route, because there's there's not that, that information or those contextual priors, that information, the body orientation that's going to be available for those perceptual systems to pick up as early. Mm -hmm. And so with that, using something like a subtle movement to the head or eye movements will essentially, you know, perturb that system, even if it's very subtly, and then a movement and then another movement is made. I mean, I mean there's not like discrete actions like I stop here and make movement. That's not obviously around meaning, but my oh. point is it's, it's just all intertwined and um, I know you guys have both mentioned Turby. We've, we've mentioned Perception Action. Uh, one of the first times I saw him uh, present on, it was actually on a, a presentation on YouTube, I believe it's in the early 2013-ish, uh, something like that. And he said, dual aspects of the same event. Mm -hmm. And I paused that there and I thought to myself, that, is, that actually makes sense for the first time, which is what led to me um, giving examples of essentially tearing a $100 bill and neither side serves a purpose as the whole once did. So essentially, it's they're they're intertwined, interconnected. They're confluent, conflated, such as he explains in that presentation. And so, if these athletes, such as the defensive backs, are trying to create these perception action couplings that are relevant for them, uh, based off of the the information that's there and their opportunities that are specified by the affordances, then I want to try to disrupt that system stability. Mm -hmm. And so that's essentially what what we do often. You know, in our and our not just receivers, but what receivers and as in running backs, tight ends, individuals who are going to be skilled players that catch the ball. Because to your point, there are a lot of really, really um, athletic people, and it is a very yeah. complex system. And there are heavy consequences that are present. And so I think we all we all know those those underpin ideas of nonlinear pedagogy. And so for me, I also want to have those those creative motor actions that emerge based off of some of these um, tightly 
intertwined action couplings that may not have been um, capable had I tried to actually do them consciously. Two really cool things pop out of that. The first is look at the good deceivers and try and figure out what they're doing because that's interesting. And then the second thing for me is that it's, it's a reconceptualization again of what faking out is. You're not trying to make your opponent know or think that you're moving one direction or another. You're trying to make them perceive that you're moving in one direction or another or doing one thing rather than another. And that's a whole different way of thinking about what faking out is. And then it would be with that mindset, it would be super cool to look at that's why i was asking you, who's the good fakers right yeah there's a there's a what lot of hard, you know, it's hard, what, yeah. what are they physically capable of doing that works yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. very cool yeah um yeah so uh, i'm connecting this back i, I want to there's a way I, I think i can connect this back to perspective oh well it's perspective information so but one of the things i wanted to draw on i think jules does a really good job in the paper is um talking about one of the things you mentioned andrew that i think this area is cool is it makes predictions about patterns of behavior you should see, yeah. right? It makes specific predictions what behave actions should look like, and yes. it's different than predictive. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we want to talk about Garrett. Do you want to? I don't know if you you know what I'm on about or you, any thoughts about that. So a little yeah. bit on that, I yeah. guess, yeah. too, of how I've been thinking about it, at least in relationship to baseball, mm -hmm. and for hitters and pitchers. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of uh, wiffle ball lately and just the crazy movement that they can put on pitches and stuff. And it hurts my brain. <laughs> <laughs> but what I noticed, at least there, it's a little bit more obvious of how when they make balls move, they'll actually change up arm slots. And there's a level of deception that goes on with that. And it made me wonder if part of the reason it works so effectively is that the expectation of where the arm slot's going to be. And yeah. same thing too with what Tyler, you were talking about and Andrew of uh, being deceptive. There's part of that may play into, there's a certain expectation of where we're anticipating either their, them going or what the, what we perceive the intention of, of the um, other person is. And that expectation can get subverted slightly um, when when it alters and deviates from that, and that that amount of time it takes for us to reconnect with the information can potentially be enough for the our opponent, so to speak, to actually do what they want to do. Wiffle ball pulls you into a movement that you can't reverse your way out of in time. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's my that's one hundred percent my experience of wiffle ball. First of all, but yeah. Um. But did you want to talk, Andrew, about kind of the the behavioral predictions you see different? Yeah, yeah. yeah this is yeah. again. I think I agree 100. This is this is why it's so cool. Is is it does? It's it's an it's a claim of the ecological approach that makes very specific predictions mm -hmm. about how a movement will unfold over time, and it makes weird predictions. So there's um what's the, the so the original one is um. Ah, oh, it's Mont Montaigne and Adal. It's it's um uh yeah him and uh what's his name Bastan maybe yeah the, 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 I'm sure Bastan yeah. was somewhere yeah probably on um, perspective control and yeah and movement, movement Move. reversals is yeah. the paper right it's mm -hmm. just amazing and the weird thing about movement reversals right so their task was uh you were trying to intercept something you were trying to uh, trying to catch something uh that was heading towards you and, and on some heading. Uh, on some angle at some speed, et cetera. And you had a wee slider and you were, so you're reduced to a one degree of freedom movement and your job's just to arrive at the right time. And there were two actually beautiful things that came out of that paper. And the first thing was that um, it's not like, if, if you think about it predictively, it, like this task actually wasn't that hard in the sense that, you know, you could kind of, there was plenty of opportunity to predict where to go. And the prediction prediction says that that's what you should do, right? You should just predict where it's going to end up move there and wait and or or arrive in time or whatever but uh, whatever it is you just move there and you're done the perspective control it turns out predicts like because you're tracking uh and they had some they had a specific hypothesis about the particular visual angle information that you were coupling to and what they did was they just plotted out the behavior of that variable over time and what happened is that some as that variable unfolded if you kept tracking it you would overshoot so you wouldn't so you'd go past where you had to end up but then as 
things as the event unfolded, the information variable would bring you back. And so it predicted these things called movement reversals. And that's just 100% what you see. And you see movement reversals, the best thing, you see them even if you start the person's hand where they need to be when the thing is going to hit. So the idea, yeah. of, and it's just it's just a beautiful, it's it's the, just the signature of yeah. being coupled to an information variable, your movement unfolding as a, the way that information variable unfolds over time. And if you follow the whole thing through, you're fine. Everything ends up in the right place at the right time. Uh, and but if you look, if you kind of looked at any moment, it would be like, oh, why are you moving that way? Like, why would you predict end up that way? And it's su super weird. And then, so that was the original experimental demonstration. Then they went and found it in goalkeepers. That's the other thing I love about mm -hmm. it. They actually went, do, do people do this crazy thing in the real world? And you see goalkeepers as they're trying to intercept a ball or tracking something in, and they've done this with real goalkeepers and goalkeepers in VR where they've got weird ball trajectories and yada yada yada. And you, goalkeepers show movement reversals they just they move this way and they move that way and they overshoot where they need to be and they come back they're very clearly tracking fairly well-defined visual information it's chef's kiss it's beautiful yeah 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 and kind of i'll let you tell it i just wanted to uh, yeah. kind of a, a study that connects with that i always think of it bootsman and colleagues did this one where they had they had balls on a string they were releasing at you mm -hmm. you couldn't see the string so you had to catch it but uh, the most interesting condition was they had condition where the ball was coming exactly where you were standing every time, but they were releasing it from different angles. So sometimes it was coming straight at you. Sometimes it's coming from the left or right. Predictive control. Why would you move? <laughs> right. You should predict right away the balls. Come, but people did different things There's based a on the angle. Movement. Yeah. And yeah. that was the one with different, uh, like inflated balls, heavily inflated, not inflated, or not inflated as much. That's the same study. Oh, this is a different one. This is a different okay. one. But that's There's kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Tyler, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say, when you you guys are all talking about this, um, you know, I think about the intrinsic dynamics, essentially the emergent tendencies of individuals. And if I'm watching film and, and athletes watch film on a fairly regular basis, whether it be the coach, whether it be the athlete, they're watching for tendencies. They're watching from tendencies for, from performers. And so um, looking back or talking or speaking back to the paper I mentioned earlier, information affordances and the control of action in the sport, Bajan and colleagues, and they talk about uh, is essentially serving as a preparatory role in action, as well as helping it tune online as it unfolds. Uh, that's the way they describe it. Actually, I, I think I could pull it up here real quick. They, it's, they say, uh, more generally, perspective control refers to the means by which actors adapt their behavior in advance to the constraints and behavior opportunities in the environment. Perception thus plays a preparatory role in action, as well as an online role in tuning action as it unfolds. And so it's interesting because for me, what this highlights is it highlights the need for seeing what the tendencies look like of the athletes that I will face or could potentially face for those that, that get an opportunity to actually evaluate film. But it doesn't mean they're predicting their behavior. And I know how he's going to cut every single time that the, the way in which the speeds are changing, the space that is available, and essentially what I'm perceiving as an individual visual perception, auditory, everything, all of that is going to help regulate my action based off of what I'm, what I've invited to do at that particular time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I actually see the need in having an idea of kind of tying it back to the deceptive aspects. If I, if I know a receiver is relatively deceptive, I may um, intentionally try to disrupt some of his deceptive qualities mm -hmm. by maybe pressing him at the line more so like if I'm a defensive back. So essentially I'm using information that was available far, far ahead of time or it could be something as subtle, kind of bringing it back to some of the studies done in soccer. You posted about it, I think, earlier today, Rob, where mm -hmm. as the expert uh, goalkeepers will oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes move later. But that doesn't mean that they're not moving a little bit to bring up that information. Body mm -hmm. orientation, you know, mm -hmm. obviously the way in which the uh, the foot is going to come in contact with the ball is going to give off a lot about what the spin is doing of the ball, especially if it's colored, such as they talked about, uh, Montagna talked about as far as the color and the lateral displacement that occurs. So anyways, I digress. But my point being is that um, perspective information, I think, can serve as a preparatory uh, type information as well based on where I am on the field. Am I near the hash? Am I near the numbers? There's going to be less space available for action. Yeah. Well, would you yeah. think about that as calibration? What's that? Would you think about that as calibration? More than sort of scaling the perceptual motor system. I, I mean, I would think about that as being highly calibrated and needing to recalibrate and recalibrate. And I, I, I that as, as a process, as as the thing, as as the way in which that 
is having its effect on your current behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think about it in in the context of because it went because at one level that's weird, right? Like yeah. we're slipping into a place where it's really easy to talk about knowledge. It's really yeah. easy to talk about what the player knows about their opponent because they have right. And I'm mean, as a, as a as a strict ecolog turvy ecological yeah, knowledge of no yeah. knowledge, yeah. right? So the question is what's the perceptual mechanism? And yeah. I'm thinking about one of the things I like about the direct learning stuff that Jacobs and Michael put together, I like the distinction they make, education of intention, attention, and then calibration, three separate elements of the learning process. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, anybody, yeah, Rob, what, what, like clearly people can do the thing you just described. Mm -hmm. So the question is ecologically, how are they doing it? Like what's the what's what's going on there? I would I would stick it in the category somehow of calibration, but I'd, like that's a a bit of a get I don't know how else to think about it. Does anybody have a way of thinking about it that doesn't use the word knowledge, right? So, so I, get, I want so you go ahead. Ahead. I want to add something. Go ahead and jump what, in. What, so what specifically were you referring to which action were you referring to? Um oh sorry, the um the watching the tapes and so getting so the mode of going behavior oh, of I'm, I'm facing off against player X and I know player X is a, is a deceptive kind of player and is good at pulling it off, so I will do certain things. I want to know how we talk about that ecologically without it being predictive, without it being, you know, <laughs> education of intention. And I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't think there's a difference. I think they all obviously are, are interwoven together. Uh, but the reason why I say education of intention, essentially how I aim to interact in the environment, how I aim to interact with this individual. So if I'm aiming to interact by disrupting their system stability, um, you know, based off of the down that is present. So we talk about the constraints that are available. You know, it's the down and distance. It's it's second and five. He's likely going to be running a slant route here. And so, you know, or could be running a slant route here. That's where I, I feel that film study is vital, not only because of the emergent behaviors of the individual, but also having an awareness of the constraints that are available prior to ball being snapped. Because prior to ball being snapped is going to shape my intentions which is also going to educate where my attention is directed in order for me to pick up more specifying information, which allows me to scale my action capabilities or calibrate. And you actually posted, this is kind of funny you say that, you just reminded me, when you when you posted a while ago, um, a kangaroo jumping on a trampoline. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. posted like something about, you know, he, he isn't calibrated at this time. Well, that now highlights the need, you know, or really emphasizes to me the need for representative learning design. How am I, how, how is there going to be, if my behaviors don't look anything like the sport and I'm training in a very decontextualized setting, how am I ever going to be able to regulate my behavior based off of the, um, the affordances that are, that are invited or, or, you know, open for me to act on. So anyway. No, I think, yeah. look, I, right. I think putting an education of intention is exactly right. The problem with that is the education of intention. That's the one we don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, I would I would think of this. I think of it as calibration, Andrew. And I the analogy I would give is when you learn to drive your car and your significant other's car and use the right brake force. So you don't all of a sudden like when you first do it or you do a rental car, right? You do that. You hit the brake too hard. After time, you learn to calibrate, you have calibrations for both of those. Thing. So you, I think you can have multiple calibrations that you can, I don't know how we, you know, go about where they are or what. So yeah. I think, I think that's what it is with players. You got you with one player, you know, I can move as soon as I see him go left. Mm. Uh, so my, my coupling is like that. The other guy, I can't, I have to have a different, I'm using yeah. the same information, the same movement, but I can't go as strong. Maybe. I do want, I do want to make a, a few points there. Number one is, and I hope the listeners out there understand that by no means am I saying that I'm choosing my actions necessarily for the entirety of the play based mm -hmm. off of that. It may just be how I, the initial conditions start. And so for me, that's the reason behind the knowledge of such as, you know, uh, Gibson, Gibson spoken to. And the second thing, the question I would ask you would be, do we need to separate them between intention, attention, calibration? Aren't they all kind of intertwined and interwoven together? Is there a need to bucket them into you know certain places? Just out of curiosity, I'm not an experimental psychologist, so I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to jump in and like at least insert into the conversation yeah. and back yeah. back to what Andrew, your question about like the film and stuff and the <laughs> sort of pre knowledge, so to speak. Mm -hmm. To me. 
it seems to be like, I really, this is why Rob, you put me onto this. Um, and Sean has been on me to dive into this more, but embodied cognition, like this, this notion that like this knowledge is embodied and is an extension of your movement. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, like what exactly to what Tyler was speaking in, speaking about, like all this stuff is intertwined. Like when you're talking about intention and mm -hmm. education of attention, like at least for me right now, it seems to me like embodied cognition nicely just pulls all that together. Yeah. And I, I think Tyler, your point, like, you know, applying it, maybe you, you're right. You don't need to, mm -hmm. but I think like, if you want to do the stuff like Bill and Brett do mm -hmm. and Andrew's done with throwing, mm -hmm where you want to develop the actual control law and model, mm -hmm. you need sure. to understand what is changing. Is it the parameters of the control law, the variables in the control mm -hmm. law, or the actual goal, um, if you want to model. But I, I under totally understand your point. For application, maybe it doesn't matter where this occurs. Yeah. But that's no, kind of good. That's no, kind sorry. of you know, because one of the things I'm interested in doing right now is taking the direct learning framework for a bit of a walk and see how mm -hmm. it does, right? Mm -hmm. I like the basic idea. I think it's kind of nice. Um, but I don't know that I'm convinced of all of it. And mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, and the notion of education of intention, right? Um, that that analysis of education of intention, education of attention, calibration, calibration, right? Kind of working your way from getting yourself into the space, you know, engaging with the space, engaging with the particular details of what's currently going on right now. That analysis makes perfect sense to me. But like I was highlighting, right, how the, how in God's name does the education of in, intention work perceptually, right? It's a big ask that we don't yet. So like conceptually, like, and, and so when I throw that framework at you and kind of using that language, like, like I'm taking it for a road test. And I, 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 I think your challenge to it is a good challenge, right? Because it was interesting. We kind of ended up in a position where we're thinking about how watching film, uh, game tape uh, affects behavior on the field and we know that it does right? I, I remember when i lived in indiana right this was this was peyton manning's big thing right he just used yeah. to watch mm -hmm. every single inch of every single movement that everybody ever made in the week that he was about to play them and he just he like and it, cl it had clear consequences right so it clearly matters but then for me that felt like calibration rob was kind of hindering that mm -hmm. but as soon as you started talking about it in terms of education of intention of getting you into the particular kind of stuff that made sense as well so again it was mm -hmm. I liked the challenge that the fact that you're in a practice setting rather than an academic setting. I liked the challenge that you threw back to that framing because it's a good question, right? Yeah. I think the one thing that stood out to me while you're talking, Andrew, was bringing, introducing this idea of attunement. And also at least when we're talking, because to me it's about them becoming attuned to specific information. So when we're talking about their intention and how does this now influence what's going on, then it their intention in my mind constrains all the options of what to uh, attend to. It actually helps helps them kind of narrow that down. And then from the, so if they've watched a ton of film, they may become more attuned to certain information. And then again, that their intention helps constrain and then pick up that information and then you know, start interacting with it. Yeah. Of course, one of the reasons why Peyton Manning got so much out of it is that he actually spent an awful lot of time on the field mm -hmm. as well. But, yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up a point, uh, uh, something go, uh, something you see with, and you sort of hit on this, Andrew, that I wanted to get Garrett and Tyler particularly as it applies to uh, you actually coaching and athletes. One of the things I think perspective control does is it turns psychology on its head in that forever we've been associated with the start of movements. Like think how many reaction time studies there are. Perspective control really with, and Jill calls it the funnel like type of control. It's really saying the start of movements is really not that important, right? We're actually kind of dumb when we start moving, right? We, we move, sometimes we move, like you said, in the completely the wrong direction. And it's through over time, it evolves, we get more accurate, we get less variable mm -hmm. as we use this information. So. It, the, this is in uh, the classic is, is Lee's, you know, long jumping studies. I mean, people running up to the board, they're hugely variable and uncontrolled in their steps at the start, but then they get, they hit the board the exact same thing every time. So paying attention to the initiation and reaction time that we've done so much of, 
perspective control is like that you're looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> um, so I think that that's for me what a really uh, you know change in the way we think about movement. And I know I don't know if that agrees with what you teach. You know, in, I think in sports we often teach like the first move is you know getting off the line. And so I don't know what you guys think about that. So I think it's a brilliant question. And, and before before I answer yeah. kind of what my thoughts are on it, I do want to highlight the fact that something, Rob, you've done exceptionally well. Uh, when I was having uh, uh, drinks with with Keith and others in England not too long ago, he mentioned, which you know I greatly appreciate, is the fact that like the need between the two, like the the, the researchers as well as the practitioners, in order for this to to see how it actually really lives in the real world, because obviously studies that are done in laboratories are important, but oftentimes they don't. They don't have all the information that is available um, mm -hmm. you know, that is going to be able to allow the, the movers to move that way in the real world. And so that that we're grateful for, for sure, because I do feel like that what we are working with in the front lines, per se, is is important. So as far as like the initial start of movement, um, you know, I think that for, back in the day I used to that was where I lived. Right. That I was trying to tell you how to start everything you did, because if you didn't start it right, you couldn't finish it right. And I realized quite quite quickly that that was absurd, and so for me, it, it may live in the initial stages of of uh, a little bit of explicit guidance, such as if I have a defensive back that is struggling to do more than just break up a pass, like if he could be in position to intercept the ball, I may I may say something as subtle as you know maybe um, at directing your attention towards the head and upper extremity area of the individual. The eyes will specify a lot about. Uh, the size of them will specify a lot about the time to contact the extremities themselves, regardless of whether it's shot out quickly and very, you know, very um, lengthwise or whether it's something where they're already out there and waiting on the contact is going to specify a lot about what's getting ready to happen. So to me, I, I can drop something like that in to the session before action unfolds. But after that, where I feel like truly learning is, learning is occurring is through experience. And, and that experience does matter because it's rich. And if I don't present a rich landscape of affordances for that opportunity to work, that athlete to work with, and I, um, Stuart Armstrong said that I use the word slices a lot, snippets, mm -hmm. slices of the game. Mm -hmm. If it's a four, five, or a six, I don't want it to be a 10 all the time. It's too complex mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So I need to create a four, five, or six to exaggerate certain affordances in order for them to have tight windows down the field at the quarterback for them to be able to hit. And so for me as a practitioner, it's the very early stages that I might make mention to. But after that, and this is the hardest, was the hardest thing for me as a, as a practitioner was, I need to be okay with the fact that me manipulating the constraints, such as the task and the environment, is me coaching and is me helping. And I just need to have a good understanding of the theoretical principles because if I don't, I'm just applying things willy-nilly. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, and that kind of the the idea that you can, the movement can compensate for itself as it goes along. The mm -hmm. first part of the, the later parts can, and you have to kind of let it happen. You don't have to get everything perfect from the start. Garrett, mm -hmm. do you see that in baseball? What do you see in, like, hitter is the the first movement of hitting, you know, is... is I mean, to is, a certain it, extent, yeah. it, it does play a role, but I think it, it comes into how we end up coaching it. So, mm -hmm. so much of, you know, are we focused on a particular move, meaning like, well, I want you to get into your back hip or, you know, more glute or more hip hinge or something like that. But to me, like, based upon the topic that we've been discussing, it, I think of like the Gibson quote of um, we perceive to act and act to perceive. And so that first move is more about helping you gather information to perceive the environment better. And so to me, it would be then shifting that to when I'm working with a, a hitter, experiment, play with your move to you want and changing their focus to how can you see the ball better? Um, how can you connect to that information better? And what moves are actually going to facilitate that? It might look different. Some guy, it might be a hip hinge. Some guy might actually want to sink and uh, bend their knees more, and it'll just look different for each guy. But in the end, it's it's more about the the movement to perceive, to help guide the rest of their action as it unfolds. Yeah, good point. Andrew, did you wanna? Yeah, that's just, Rob, your question was spot on because it's just, it's it. Like when you think it, like taking perspective control seriously makes you realize that your reaction time is the least important part of any of it because that's mm -hmm. not what's driving it. That's a that's a really interesting angle to, to emphasize. And it also makes me think, so um, 
uh, Rhino Bootsma does a, a bunch of stuff, and he's he's been looking at um, a bunch of information variables for control of various things, steering and navigation and stuff. And it's funny, he, he thinks of it in terms of these fractional information variables. And I finally realized actually what he's doing. And I think what's, what he's actually finding is that for the first little bit of the movement, people are using position-based information. And then as soon as enough time has gone by that velocity-based information is available, the better velocity-based information for this particular task, as soon as that's available, people switch to it. But what happens is that, and, and so if you look over the course of the trial, you kind of, it looks like they're using not a first order variable, not a second order variable, but something in between on average. But no, I think what they're doing is they're switching. And the switch happens at the beginning. And why? Because at the beginning, they haven't moved, just as Garrett was saying, they have not yet moved sufficiently to make the good quality specifying information that they need available. It takes time for that to show up. But as soon as it's available, boom, people switch to it. Yeah. So like that emphasis, that that switch of emphasis from thinking about reaction time. I think about the what's the uh, the NFL combine, right? They will do, they do a lot of reaction timey sprinting kind of things, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. yeah, and it's there's people have been complaining about that for you know a million years. But it's a really interesting. Again, this just gets to the idea that perspective control is a place where the rubber really meets the road between the two different approaches of thinking about skill acquisition. And we win a lot. <laughs> and that's, I know, but, which is yeah. awesome. But, but, but that's why it's amazing. And that's why it's interesting. And it's such a good way of thinking about all the key elements as well. Yeah. So that, that was a great point. I loved it. Something you just mentioned there and what Garrett was, was just talking about, uh, which I found to be very interesting. And I've been I've been really not like gathering information such as like writing it all down, but just over the past probably six to seven years that I've really been applying these principles at varying levels. One thing that I have found when I'm trying to set up essentially these or design in these affordances to the practice design, whether it's a 2v2, 2v3, 1v1, whatever it may be, whenever the defenders or the offensive players are starting in a static position, so they're not moving at all, there's no, there's no subtle backpedal. There's no shift as a, like a linebacker that's moving. They are almost always unsuccessful at the task. Mm -hmm. Whenever they're allowed to move even just a subtle bit or even I encourage movement, and that's something that is that, uh, that education of in, you know, intention, how I aim to interact. One thing that has been, this is something I've actually been thinking about sharing for a while and I haven't on a call, but it's been so, so beneficial for me as a coach, which has been helpful, obviously, for the players, is just the, this the suggestion of, hey, try this next one whenever you're moving a little bit. Hmm. And yeah. so I'm not telling them how to act necessarily, but essentially allowing for them to pick up information differently. Move, move versus not moving. That's cool. And it's interesting that you just observed it. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, we see the same in things like pedestrian crossing mm -hmm. and driving. People make more accurate decisions about when to go. And it's completely, it, you know, it's uh, completely consistent with perspective control, right? When perspective control tells me, am I what I'm doing now going to get me to where I want to be? When you're not doing anything now, right? There's no perspective information when you're not moving. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't become active until you move in some way. So um, it totally, the other one, a uh, practical example with, if we go back to baseball is explains why it's really the hardest ball to catch is that outfield is the one straight over your head. If you look at the, this perspective information, uh, you can perfectly explain why that's the case. <laughs> yes. um, the other, I guess the other thing I wanted to quickly get to is the, you know, maybe this applies to the, the fat, one of the things, arguments against perspective control is when you have to move really quickly, how could you possibly control online, right? We have visual motor delays, like it takes the time for information to get to our eyes, to our muscles. If we're moving a really fast movement like baseball batting or something, how could we possibly do that? Do you, any thoughts on that kind of point? Can I just jump in and say that immediately connects to the thing you were just saying a second ago, namely that, yeah, it takes a little while for the system to get up and running, but once it's up and running, mm -hmm. then you're off to the races, right? So the issue is, yeah, there might be that initial delay, but once the system, like the goal is not to, it's the it's the switch of thinking of an information processing and information transmission stage by stage by stage versus uh, tuning up a system and getting it running and resonating to whatever it's currently like those two different metaphors right mm -hmm. so yeah it takes time to get up and running but once you're up and running then actually the issue of delays may or may not 
uh, be the right question. And like, you know, so I know for a fact that when people look at um, and neural networks and, and, and network thinking about the brain, um, there's these things called motifs, right, which is just ways of arranging nervous uh, nervous system components or network components so that they do certain things. And some of these motifs, it turns out, no delay. The whole point of them is they're a structural organization that once they are up and running, there's no functional delay. You got to get them up and running, but at least it's physical, physiologically possible, right? So I think I think your question immediately just connects back to what you were saying about reaction time, who cares? The question mm -hmm. is, what happens once you're up and running? What's available to you? And what are you current, you know, what's the state of the system once it's doing and not at any given instant in time, but across the whole action. Yeah. And I'm sure you guys both see that, Garen Tyler, like things that are really fast, you're you're still seeing adjustments. They may be small, but they're they're going, there's online. Oh. Yeah. It's I constant. Guess, uh, constant uh, go ahead, Garrett. Well, I, I had one question. I don't know if we have necessarily time for it, but the question that I had was, how does this play in when you have things like no look passes or there is a video of Joe Maurer, there was a ball hit off the um, backstop and he he looks, he sees it and then he turns his head and then he uh, puts his hand down and is able to catch the ball. So I guess how how does, does per perspective control play into actions <laughs> where at the end, the the performer is not necessarily looking at um, what it is he's necessarily doing. He either got lucky or maybe he saw enough of the event to have all the perspective information that he needed. Maybe that's the skill, is that one of the things you do is that you need less and less of the event to get access to the prospective information. But it does still take time. He still had to look at it before it worked. But, you know. the, examples, the example you just gave, Andrew, was the, the ones that were with, uh, I think it was Ronaldo in soccer, and they're turning the lights off and yeah. you know, able to pick up enough of the information. Uh, to, to go back to your question that you asked, Rob, I, I would say, number one, it's just that constant updating is that constant need for recalibrating and recalibrating and and really what speaks to to me i hear perceptual attunement and uh, you know i go back again and i know i've said it two or three or four times already but the experience and the experience in something that is some somewhat representative like I, it doesn't have to be a 10 it shouldn't be a 10 we talked about that on calls before but it, it definitely should have some aspects of the affordances that they're going to overlap either with the target sport or or they're going to be present exactly in the target sport Otherwise, you, that's when you start to hear uh, coaches or even commentators saying, well, they're out of sync. Well, they're out of sync because they haven't been experiencing anything like it. They're not calibrated to it whatsoever. They're not attuned to the information. And so whenever the affordances are specified by that information, they can't even act upon them because their action capabilities don't meet you know, that, that requirement. And that's the way I see it as far as as far as the sport, and that's way why you hear, um, you know, us in emergence and Sean and I specifically talking about just the need for certain levels of representative task design and whether it's right wrong or otherwise i can tell you that when i put my athletes in situations that are not like the game and i used to do that often they were not very good at the game and when i put my athletes in front of different problems to solve on a regular basis and they can essentially search through their opportunities and see what their affordance they were going to accept or affordances they were going to accept they're far better at their sport are you telling me people learn to do that? <laughs> yeah, crazy? Yeah. That's big, big if true, man. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, and your point, Garrett, was a good one. And if you really go crazy with the outfielder problem literature, they've tested all these kind of things like directly when the ball disappears mm -hmm. or when it suddenly changes direction at the last minute. Or um, and But the perspective control, I think you're right. As long as you get enough, right, you – you and you if you stop you don't need continuous information right you, you if you just kept doing what you're doing and the and the ball didn't change and the trajectory didn't change you would end up in the right place you want to you know you want to use the information if it's available but you can go through these gaps where you have to look but i feel there takes their eye off the ball to look at the wall mm -hmm. like that it does you know and then comes back the the gap when you don't have information you know what to do right you you, you just keep following the same what you've been doing for you assume my current future is going to get me the goal. Yeah. I certainly had that experience just literally just experience of like, so when I first started playing softball, I was playing first base. And when I first started playing softball, I was chasing everything, right? Mm -hmm. It came off the bat in the vague direction of first base. I went after it. Right? <laughs> after couple, yeah. After a couple of seasons, right, I was standing at first base and just watching these things within, I like, I had the actual experience of no badly because I, 
and and me and was paying attention to these things but also i just flat out noticed that like i needed to watch it about a meter off the bat and then i was like oh yeah that's my responsibility or that's outfield's responsibility and i immediately knew that, that then switched me into either going after the ball or getting ready on first base to take a potential out and i think yeah so i agree rob like just that that experience but i think sort of theoretically and conceptually that makes sense as well as the as the event unfolds the information becomes available once you reach a certain point that information is available and actually once you've got it and and one of the things about fly balls is of course is that um there's nothing pushing them anymore right it's just it's just um uh, uh, projectile motion so the physics of it are very straightforward etc so you can just do these certain things and so on and so forth yeah yeah back about two or three years ago whenever i first started reading about perspective control and i've referenced the paper already Fajin and turvy and colleagues they said, and you're, you're speaking to like reactions and different stuff, they said in the absence of perspective control, action would be reduced to merely reacting, which would not suffice in many fast-paced sporting environments. And mm -hmm. I remember when I read that, I, at that time, I had not actually really, didn't really know truly what perspective control was, but I was like, well, that makes sense. And then, you know, you even hear practitioners in the field now saying, well, their reaction time is better. It's like, well, if they're reacting, just purely reacting to something, number one, they're probably not moving, which mm -hmm. means they're not picking up information to guide further movement. And they're probably not going to be very successful. But that's what really spoke spoke to me was that merely reacting part. Yeah, just catching. Yeah. That's it. The, that's yeah. it. That's the difference. You're not like there's a difference between reacting and starting to produce an appropriate action. Those are two wildly different things. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And bring it all around. I wanted to get back to your you know embodied cognition and perception, Garrett. I think where this applies, one of the things that we really haven't figured out in perspective control, for example, with the fly ball example is kind of what happens at the end, right? It gets you to the ball, but how do you slow down appropriately? How do you know how high to put up your gun your glove? And that's where I think you know perceiving some of the stuff like Jeff Bingham and and, and Bill have done perceiving the world in body units which is kind of embodied perception you know how, how many strides left before i get to the ball you know that kind of thing is is the way that you can kind of get at these some of those issues you know perceiving the ball in eye heights um arm lengths you know so i think we, we need some work to do to figure out what, exactly what's going on there but i think that's how you can kind of tie it all in so that thing is something that you're speaking to rob is something i i've really been trying to look into myself and i remember you've spoken to it quite eloquently on a on a podcast i think you were talking about gibson at the time but you're saying like the updating of the mapping between the perceptual systems and the action systems that part is very intriguing to me and i'm, I'm still seeking uh more information there but that 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 embodied cognition aspect does seem to kind of encapsulate it mm -hmm. you know the calibration stuff that jeff does is, is dense i mean it's jeff right he, his papers yeah. are but they're good and calibration is he's it's a it's a topic he's really spent a great deal of time engaging with because he understands how important it is because it's it's a very non-trivial issue you want to be able to tell us an information-based story as to why you were using information that way right mm -hmm. and it's, yeah and it's complicated but it's rewarding when you get into it yeah yeah so i guess we should wrap it up we've gone around <laughs> we could talk all day this is a fun topic does it, i don't know if we want to go around the room anyone have any last words or anything they want to say on the topic uh tyler i yeah, will go there i think i think for me more than anything this has been an enlightening conversation and, and i really feel like it's been an opportunity to be transparent about a lot of things uh for me particularly you know as a practitioner kind of things that i it admittingly, like working through, I feel like I have a, a good grasp of the ideas that form an ecological approach. And essentially, you know, we're, you know, I would have never thought that I'd be in study, I'd be studying ecological psychology as a, as a young kid. But like, I'm not an experimental psychologist. But at the same time, I need to have a good understanding of the ideas in order for me to create relevant uh, practice activities for my athletes. And so, I'll continue to update. But I can tell you that this is something that is literally being breathing on a regular basis here. Um, in the States. And there's a massively growing number of people who are, if anything else, they're like, well, that seems to make more sense. They, they may, may not be able to put their finger on why, uh, but they also know that they experience it as coaches and they've had those fleeting moments why. So more than anything, thanks to you guys as the researchers for putting out good material and we'll continue to keep using it. <laughs> Andrew, did you? Yeah, it's just so thank you, everybody. This is a lot of fun. I always get a lot out of the, out of a conversation throwing um, all this kind of stuff around, and I've got a lot of things to add to sort of think about. Um, I, th I think the, the the point, Tyler, just about connecting to uh, like the, the the things that we're doing in the, in sort of academic and research sort of ends, and how that's being received 
and the more practice-based kind of ideas. Um, you would, you said something earlier about you having to make the sort of the transition for yourself of, of understanding that manipulating constraints is coaching. Mm -hmm. You take this approach. And I'm, I, I've become endlessly fascinated actually by the fact that um, the things we are talking about, perspective control, it's not just a tweak on anything. It's, 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 and this is why it's kind of a nice example because it's a kind of a really clear example of the absolutely tremendous rethink you have to do in order to really engage with these ideas. Um, and just thinking, yeah, and I'm thinking about the idea of like, it doesn't just tweak the job of a coach. It fundamentally changes the job of the coach. The job of the coach now is to create these environments and that's coaching. It's coaching in action. It's coaching, it's, it's embodied coaching, right? And it's so fundamentally different. And it's just really interesting that this topic, this issue of perspective control, getting just really naturally brings up that massive shift in thinking uh, that's really kind of required. So again, this is confirming my basic belief that perspective control is one of the single most fun interesting relevant useful topics that we're currently got going on right now because there's there's data on it and we're comparing theories and it's and it's and it's a nice way of conceptualizing and thinking about all the the really radical mind shifts you have to do to get into this stuff so yeah thank you that was a ton of fun before Garrett jumps in i i just want to highlight what you just now said because that is exactly what it is as far as the complete yeah. shift said and and that is what is very challenging for a lot of coaches but of course. Um, but it, it was very difficult for me. I'm like, did I just have I been wasting people's time for the past seven years? So that part's that's a hard that's a hard question to answer. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Garrett, did you want to? Um, I mean, it's it's kind of hard to follow up uh, Andrew's <laughs> answer, but um, he he definitely highlights like why for me this is something that I'm really really interested in and really passionate about and find it super fun uh, to to jump down this rabbit hole because I think it it does explain things a lot better. Um, than before, because we were always struggling, struggling um, to see like why was it that some guys like these things worked, and then for other guys, um, you know, from a traditional model approach, like why would some guys get better and others not? And I think this, for me, this takes sort of my ego out of it um, and allows me to be alongside the athletes and help them. Um, and I don't necessarily have to have all the answers like, and that's something as a coach, I really like, um, is that I, I just need to understand certain principles and through that I can guide them to finding the answer or finding what works best for them. And so that's, for me, that's, that's what I really love about like these ideas. Yeah. No, great points guys. And yeah, as a researcher, I would say, you know, I think we did a good job today showing that. This is still an evolving idea. Perspective mm -hmm. control is a great, really powerful information-based control. But like you, the one you mentioned, Andrew, Brett's idea of affordance-based mm -hmm. control is like just 10 years old, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's all we're and the points you guys made are Garrett and Tyler about deception and studying film and like that's all good stuff. Like keep challenging and grow, but we still we not it doesn't have all the answers right now. It's still a developing theory, and um, so I think it, it it but I think it's a really I, it's amazing. It's a wonderful concept, I think, mm -hmm. both, um, you know, powerful and that explaining behavior. And I think it's just like we keep saying, it's just a really cool thing, <laughs> perspective control. So I would really encourage anyone to kind of dive in and try to to make sense of it. It's something you have to kind of read it a while to get to get the point of it. At first, it's like, oh, it's, that's what's the deal. <laughs> but you once you get it. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys. And um, I'm going to stop the broadcast here. Thanks for everyone that followed. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.